Hey, pastors, we know you love your clerical shirt because of what it means, but how does it feel? Under all those vestments, is it hot and sticky? Is it too tight, too loose, or just not comfortable? Wicking Vicar has the solution for you. The Performance Clerical Shirt, featuring four-way stretch to let you move and moisture-wicking fabric to keep you cool. Plus, it's machine washable and wrinkle-resistant. Visit wickingvicar.com and treat yourself to more stretch, more movement, and easy care. The Performance Clerical from wickingvicar.com. Wickingvicar.com. Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is, the mind of Christ, and to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we are continuing our series on the Augsburg Confession, today covering Article 21 on the worship of the saints. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of Bethlehem Evangelical Lutheran Congregation in Mason City, Iowa, and my companion confessor in conversation about this article today is Pastor Tim Sims. He is senior pastor of St. John Lutheran Church and School in Chester, Illinois. Pastor Sims, welcome back to Concord Matters. Good to be with you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Hope you're doing well there in Mason City. Absolutely. Miss being around you there in the circuit in Southern Illinois, but things are going well. We're settling in here in Mason City. And great to have you back on here to talk about a topic that, having been in the same circuit as you and so forth, I know is a topic that you're passionate about as I am, and not always rightly understood by our fellow Lutherans. We've kind of fallen out of a right understanding of this. And so it's good to get into this article today and cover this worship of the saints. Uh, We might also hear the terminology that the apology uses, invocation of the saints to call upon, and we'll kind of get into all of that here today. But let's go ahead and get started here by first just reading the article from the Augsburg Confession in its entirety. And of course, on this show, remember that we use Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, available to you from Concordia Publishing House, the publishing arm of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And this is Article 21 from the Augsburg Confession on Worship of Saints. Our churches teach that the history of saints may be set before us so that we may follow the example of their faith and good works according to our calling. For example, the emperor may follow the example of David, cite Second Samuel, in making war to drive away the Turk from his country. For both are kings. But the scriptures do not teach that we are to call on the saints or to ask the saints for help. Scripture sets before us the one Christ as the mediator, atoning sacrifice, high priest, and intercessor, citing 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 through 6. He is to be prayed to. He has promised that he will hear our prayer, citing John 14, verse 13. This is the worship that he approves of above all other worship, that he be called upon in all afflictions. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And there they are quoting from 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And that's the entirety of Article 21 from the Augsburg Confession on the Worship of Saints. So as I had in my little setup there, not always rightly understood among us as Lutherans, but they lay out right there in the first line that talk of the saints and even recognizing the saints is beneficial and good and yet They also then go on and say that, obviously, we should not pray to the saints. So go ahead and get us into this here, Pastor Sim, and kind of lay out for us what they're putting forward here in this article and how we are to rightly understand the role of the saints within the church. Well, I think it's really important for us to note that the Lutheran confessors at this point are not in any way saying that the saints play no role in the life and piety of the Christian church. But instead, they're trying to establish rightly what exactly is that role. 
and there's a lot of problems with this regarding the Roman church at the time. In the opposite direction, there may be some some struggles with this uh, when it comes to Reformed churches and even ourselves as Lutherans, as far as what that actual role is. They do play a vital role, and it's important for us to remember them and to look to their way of life. I'm basically paraphrasing scripture there from Hebrews. So it is important for us to do that, but the question is how? What role do they actually play? And what role were they playing in the Roman church at the time that the Lutheran confessors felt the need to include this in the Augsburg Confession? And does that have any bearing on some of our challenges and struggles today in the church? Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it there, that they have a role, but the question is, what is the role? And as you set that up for us, then I think maybe a good place to go next here is to actually take a look at some of the things that you were starting to get there. Uh, you know, what role did they play for the Roman Catholic Church? And I think here we can talk both historically as well as even still today. Uh, what role did the Lutheran confessors put forward? And then you also talked about, you know, there's, I always basically say, you know, basically everybody else, right? But we can throw that under the other reformed. But of course, there's just a whole spectrum when it comes to the other reformers and so forth. And not sure that we even have enough time to get into the details of how each of those church bodies view the role of the saints, whether historically or still today, but kind of just in a broad terms. So kind of lay out those three positions for us, if you will, the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran confessors, and then uh, basically everyone else, the other reformed. Yeah, so, and and as I talk about this, there really hasn't been a whole lot that's changed since the time of the Reformation, honestly. But I'll talk about the Roman Church, the Lutheran Confessors, and us now, and also the other Reformed leaders of the time and Reformed churches today. We often get lumped in, they just kind of say the Protestant churches, and yet Orthodox Lutheranism is uniquely reform. We actually still see ourselves as reformed Catholics, which is quite a different way of looking at it than most of the other reformed and Protestant churches do. And so we maybe have kept some things or tweaked and adjusted some things that they just threw out altogether. So let's, I guess, start off just considering what the Roman church was doing at the time. And of course, that would have included the Lutheran churches before the Reformation began as well. And even Luther knew himself some of the things that he was doing as a monk and the things that were involved with that. So the Roman church put forth the idea that saints not only pray for us, but are also to be prayed to. And while they may not put it in these words, pray to as if they are our Savior or God, as if they are our help. And so the Lutheran reformers were speaking very much against this. Uh, we'll talk about the Lutheran position here in just a second. The Roman church also put forth this idea, and this was very much in play in Luther's time, and Luther was very troubled by it, and that is the idea that these saints also provide a bank of merits. Those things which they had done, their faithful piety, from which Christians could receive help in gaining sufficient merits needed for their salvation. Uh, this is obviously problematic when we consider the true Christian faith proclaiming that it is the merits of Christ that give salvation and not anybody else's merits, a wonderful saint or ourselves, but Christ alone. And then thirdly, as part of the piety of the time, and I think still very much in play today, certain saints were believed to help us in specific situations where we needed help. And so they were to be called upon or invoked, uh, prayed to, if you will, for their aid and their rescue. Uh, so using things that were in play at the time and still are to this very day, St. Joseph the worker, not so much, I think, at this time when you're not talking about the same type of home ownership the situations like we have in the United States of America today, a very different way of doing property at the time. But to this day, uh, you, you can go to a Roman Catholic bookstore or buy online a house selling kit 
where you literally take a statue of St. Joseph the worker. For some reason, I honestly just don't know what the, the purpose is here, but you bury him upside down uh, in your front yard and you offer certain prayers and St. Joseph will help you sell your house. Uh, I have some wonderful, faithful Catholic friends, and I say that they're faithful Catholics. <laughs> they uh, have talked uh, recently about how, you know, you, if, you, if you go to St. Anthony, if you've lost something, He's the patron saint of lost things, so you know you'll uh, you'll be able to find whatever you've lost if you call upon him. It's amazing how it works. You just ask him to help you find it, and and before you know it, it shows up. And so all these things may sound, I guess, a little bit trivial, but there's something very problematic, if not outright idolatrous, in calling upon saints to give us aid and to help us in miraculous ways, when it is clearly God through Jesus Christ that we should be praying to, not the saints. So the Lutheran confessors made some distinctions. Okay, so here again, they're not throwing the saints out altogether. Lutherans believe that good theology is really about making distinctions. And that's exactly what they did here. So they point out and believed, hey, the saints do pray for us. Uh, Revelation 5 verse 8 gives this image of heaven where the prayers of the saints are rising up in pleasing fashion into the nostrils and face of our Lord as incense. And so just because saints have gone to rest in heaven doesn't necessarily mean they've stopped praying. But the difference is, who are we to pray to? So saints on earth pray, saints in heaven pray, but who do we pray to? The saints in heaven are praying to God, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, with the aid of the Holy Spirit. And we're doing the exact same thing here, okay? And so we don't pray to the saints, but the saints do pray for us. Uh, secondly, saints are to be remembered as examples. Just as you read, it's worded very well in what was written there in the confession. We are to look to saints as examples. And that can be very, very helpful to us. So many faithful people in the Bible and after the Bible in the New Testament church, from the time the New Testament ends all the way up to this very day, we are given wonderful examples of saints that defined as those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation, have endured great adversity, and have persevered by the power of the Holy Spirit, remaining in faith even through great trial uh, and even horribly painful martyrdom. And we can look to those as great examples of how we are to live as well. But the Lutheran confessors and we today say a line is crossed when we look to them for merits. They don't give me merits. They don't help me with salvation. They are great examples for me to look to, to say, okay, has other people have experienced difficult times? How have they dealt with that? And of course, we look to people who have come before us, who've been moved to remain faithful. Um, I, I have to admit, I, I personally got into studying these things after I became a pastor. I didn't even realize until after the fact that my ordination and installation took place on the eve of St. James the Greater, the day that our church, including the Lutheran Church, remembers and commemorates St. James the Greater. And uh, his story is that uh, he was one of the, he was the first apostle martyred, and he shared Christ, and he was cut down by the sword because he refused to renounce Christ. And so not long after that, I ended up getting a clergy ring, and it bears the shield of St. James the Elder. And the symbol is a cross in the shape of a sword. Now, I don't look to St. James to give me merits, but what that cross serves as a great reminder for me is that just as St. James was faithful even unto death, my God and Savior Jesus Christ will and does give me the strength through his word and spirit to keep me faithful even if I were to endure such trials and struggles. And so we can look to them as great examples of what it is to persevere in the faith. Not give us merits for salvation, but to trust in the one 
that they trusted in, even in the midst of trial. Uh, thirdly, then, of course, any aid or rescue that is to be sought, whether it's trivial or truly significant, should be sought only from the one from whom any help can actually come, and that is God himself. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, there's one mediator and one God, and he gave himself as a ransom so that we may have salvation. He's the mediator. One of the things that the Lutherans were correcting was that somehow Jesus is not approachable, so you have to kind of go through the saints. And we don't believe that at all. We look to the saints and say, wow, they found great hope and comfort in being able to go in the name of Jesus and through Jesus to their heavenly father. He not only was approachable, but he constantly approaches us in word sacrament and gives us the strength that we need to endure such trials. So if we're going to look to anyone for our aid and rescue, it's not a saint. It's the one who those saints trusted in, Jesus Christ himself. So I mentioned the other non-Lutheran reformers. But in all fairness, I think we often fall into this category as well. The non-Lutheran reformers, initially we were kind of on the same page. But as time went along, what we see is that they really went overboard or maybe accused the Lutherans of not going far enough in just kind of getting rid of the saints altogether and treating them as if they're of no significance at all. In this way, they kind of uh, throw the baby saints out with the bathwater, so to speak. And they just say, there's no role. There's nothing that we need to look at here. Nothing that can be inspiring or helpful to us. We shouldn't be talking about or looking to the saints at all. And I think there's been some influence from the non-Lutheran Protestants over the years, especially in American Lutheranism, that has caused us to not really consider them at all. I think there's been a good resurgence with the help of a refocus on the church calendar and so forth with some of our hymnals. But we need to be very careful not to just throw everything out and say, no, the saints are not important at all. They don't play any role at all. We don't even need to be talking about them. That is not what we get from those and reformers in the uh, Augsburg Confession. Yeah, you mentioned there the return to the liturgical calendar of our church body that does, you know, especially if you take a look in your Lutheran service book hymnal or a lot of the resources that we do put out, you know, different calendars from our seminaries and things like that, it will highlight how those saints days do fall on that liturgical calendar. Another great resource is the treasure and daily prayer that I recommend for folks to use. And whenever there's a saint day, it will come up and highlight that in there as well. And a lot of times, I think you're right, you know, we as Lutherans today have kind of fallen into that other Reformed camp where we've just ignored the saints. And I see a lot of Lutherans just get completely surprised by saying, you know, well, what are these saint days doing in here? That's Roman Catholic. We don't do that. And we're always so worried about being Roman Catholic personally. And I mentioned this on the show all the time, so it's nothing new for our listeners. But I think if we should be worried of anything, we should be worried of looking too reformed like the other reformers because as you rightly said we are reformed catholics we are evangelical catholics we are connected to the church and its history and we didn't throw everything out at the reformation and so you know as it relates to this article this is one of those things that as we'll talk a little bit about here as well this kind of closes out the section of the main articles of the augsburg confession that are just simply confessing the faith and what are generally held. And we haven't seen a lot of disagreement on a lot of these articles as we come to them. Eventually, after this article, Article 22, we shift to, you know, the things that basically were what the Augsburg Confession was supposed to confess in the first place. And this would have been included in those Torgau articles as well, the worship of the saints, all of those abuses that the Roman Catholic Church were doing that we did need to get rid of. And there were things that we did get rid of, but what we could retain, we did. And I think that this is a good kind of hinge pin article here because there's a lot that we can retain. We should retain the honor of the saints, do the saints for their faithful lives. And it's interesting there that you mentioned, you know, several times, and this is an important thing to highlight for sure that, you know, they don't merit salvation for us. 
I think especially as we consider our contemporary applications or contemporary settings, Roman Catholics today, they generally, especially American Roman Catholics, they really, they don't consider that the saints merit salvation for them. You know, they'll, and, and this comes out in the confutation as well. It basically boils down to the question of, well, yeah, the saints pray for us. And you mentioned that, right? That yes, they do pray for us, but it's right to understand how they pray for us according to scripture. And so we're going to definitely get into some of that here. But the thing that you'll commonly encounter today with the Roman Catholics, right, is that, oh, well, you know, it's like when I'm sick or something and I ask my friend to pray for me, that's all I'm doing for the saints, right? And so I've learned to kind of say this, well, I mean, it's important to say that praying to the saints doesn't merit salvation for us. It's also important to say that they don't merit anything else for us either, right? St. Joseph cannot help you sell your house. St. Anthony cannot help you find whatever you lost, your lost keys or, or whatever else have you, right? I mean, these saints don't merit these things for you. Now, if you want to talk about Joseph as a saint, and we rightly do this, how about that Joseph sets a really good example for how to be a good father, that he was the earthly father to the savior of the world, right? And taught Jesus a trade and all of those sorts of things. You know, these are right ways to honor the saints and all centered on the faith. You know, clearly Jesus was raised in a faithful household directed toward God's word. And at a young age, not just because he's the divine son of God, but at a young age, he could sit in the temple and talk with the great scholars. Well, that had to be done at the home. You know, Jesus was a man. We don't deny that. He had to learn that. Uh, So clearly that household was oriented in such a way. That's a way to honor the saints. And that's why, at least when I can, as it comes up in the liturgical calendar, I try to honor those saints days and highlight. And I always make it a part of my sermons just to kind of continue to teach and reaffirm, you know, we're not looking to these saints to do anything special for us other than be great examples of how we live as faithful Christians. Uh, Did you want to reflect back on any of that there? Well, I'll give a big amen to all that. I love the example of Joseph that you give. Uh, You're right. He's not going to help you sell your house. But boy, looking at his story, or in some ways, the lack of his story, (laughs) what becomes abundantly clear is that he simply goes with the will of the Lord and is willing to be submissive to God's plan in being a faithful father to Jesus and a faithful husband to Mary, according to God's will, all glory be to God. We don't have a whole lot on Joseph, except for what we have in Luke 1 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 2. And that's pretty much it. And yet there's a beauty in that, because really, what can I take from that? looking to the life of this Saint Joseph as a father. What I can take from that is me being a father is not about me at all. It's about the Lord, all glory to his name, and it's about doing what I should do as a husband and father for the sake of my wife and my children. And if I can look to Joseph as a great example of that, wonderful. Praise be to God. And I like the way you bring up the point about It really isn't, it doesn't seem to be anyway, to be nearly as much of an issue these days of the whole bank of merits. And I don't think most, I don't, any Roman Catholics that I know think that way. But as far as abuses goes, one of the things that is very problematic still to this day, I believe uh, Pope Francis actually came out in recent months and actually stated that we do not believe Mary to be, I'm quoting him at this point, we do not believe Mary to be co-redemptress. Uh, okay, great. But you, at some point, you also have to ask yourself, functionally, who is it that I look to for my salvation? Prayer in and of itself is a confession of faith. If you are praying to someone, even with the expectation that they'll forward that prayer on to Jesus or the Heavenly Father, that's problematic. Because at that point, you're kind of trusting in Mary or whoever else it is you're praying to, to do that for you. As opposed to simply saying, you know what, as of Jesus Christ coming and dying and rising and ascending into heaven and making me a child of God in baptism and faith, that curtain, using the biblical story, that curtain's torn. I don't need to go through anybody. I look to Jesus Christ and he's my mediator and I look to him alone. In the early uh, 
you know, in the Catholic Church at the time, there were a lot of abuses with this. And a lot of people really were looking to the saints as those they needed to pray to and look to, to get them to Jesus, as opposed to simply looking at Jesus as the one who gets us to the Father, which is the way that Jesus speaks all the time. Uh, especially, interestingly enough, as you look to John's gospel, and he writes his gospel after piety starting to develop in the church. I think it's interesting that he really stresses that Jesus constantly said, I and the Father are one. You get to the Father through me, not through anyone else. And that was not happening at the time that the Augsburg Confession was written, and there were a lot of abuses. And at that time anyway, and I, I don't know that I have the knowledge to say today, but at that time anyway, there was also a lot of money. You know the old expression, follow the money. There was a lot of money being made by the church in the cult of the saints, through pilgrimages, through relics, and all those types of things. They were raising a lot of money for the church, and so this confession by the Lutheran reformers would have hit them in the pocketbook too, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons why they didn't appreciate it uh, a whole lot either. Uh, I, I've heard people who give commentary on the Augsburg Confession state that this particular article is the one that may have been the biggest surprise in the sense that, as it's included here, this is one of them that really caused a big firestorm amongst the Roman Catholics in response. And they weren't necessarily expecting that, that it would be as big of a deal as it turned out to be. Yeah, well, and even as you consider, you know, what we know of Luther's protector, right, Frederick, that, you know, he had a great collection of relics from the saints, right? And so it would have hit him as well. And so it's only by the grace of God and the power of his word that convinces Frederick not to come down and, and just forsake Luther and give him up to be, you know, murdered or whatever by the Roman Catholics and the emperor and so forth, but yet protects him. And and we give thanks to God for that. But highlight in all of this discussion too, I think what it really boils down to, and we, here we see how interconnected all of these articles of our confession of faith are. And we talk about this all the time, right? That it's a body of doctrine with many ways to enter into and talk about the one true faith. And so when we're talking about this, what we're also talking about is our theology of prayer. It's not just about the saints, but it's about how we pray. And we see that in some of the different language, you know, between the Augsburg Confession, at least as we have in our reader's edition, it translates it as you know, the worship of saints is how the article is put forward here. The apology talks about it as the invocation of saints. And, you know, even if you don't know Latin, we know that phrase invoke, right, to call upon. We begin our worship services, our divine services with an invocation. We call upon the name of our triune God, right, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's how we gather together as God's people, as given to us in Scripture. But we do not call upon the saints, and we don't pray to them because, and I think this is the thing that happens with all of these. It's it's a slippery slope, right? Uh, even looking to the saints to pray for you, which scripture does say they do, right? But, and I think you see this in broader American evangelicalism and even at times comes into Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate as well, right? That even my friends that are alive, you know, if I can just get enough people to pray for me, right? And especially the right people to pray for me then I'll get what I want from God, right? You know, I'll get the healing that I want or something like that. And you know, that's not a faithful understanding of prayer and what it is to go to our gracious Heavenly Father who invites us to come to Him. As dear children, talk to their dear Father, right? We have that direct access. We don't need others to pray for us. And yet there is a blessing when we have a right understanding of prayer of others praying for us, right? And praying properly as scripture gives to us. And so uh, that's some of what we need to talk about here too, right? It is, you know, how we call upon the name of the Lord rightly and understand the saints and those sorts of things. I think of Psalm 121, right? I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, right? There's a lot of other scripture passages that inform for the Lutheran reformers here, the confessors, the Lutheran confessors, how they confess this faith regarding the saints and the proper role that they have versus uh, what the abuses become and so forth. And so we want to get into some of that as well. So we're going to take a break here. But on the other side of the break, we're going to pick up with 
digging into some of the scripture passages that are cited here in this article and also pulling from the apology as well and some of the scripture passages they cite there, but also other passages for how we have a right understanding of looking to the saints as a faithful example, but not invoking and calling upon them for help that is against scripture. So we'll continue talking about that on the other side of the break with our guest today, Pastor Tim Sims. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, and you're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. The word of Christ comes forth from his mouth as a sharp, two-edged sword. By that word, he puts our sin to death, and he raises us to new life in him. Join me, Pastor Timothy Apple, on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on KFUO, as guest pastors from around the world lead us into the word of God to help us sharpen our faith in Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. And welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue looking at Article 21 from the Augsburg Confession on the Worship of Saints here today with our guest, Pastor Tim Sims. He's Senior Pastor of St. John Lutheran Church and School in Chester, Illinois. And Pastor Sims, just before the break, we were laying the foundation really in the first segment of, and I like how you put it there, the saints have a role. The important question is, what is the role? And you laid that out really well for us, taking a look at the role that the saints have, at least on paper and generally speaking for the Roman Catholics historically and still today. Also for the Lutherans, again, at least on paper, (laughs) and I say that in terms of our theology as we confess that theology as a church body, we can't in any of these things ever speak for every individual that you ever encounter. You probably know Roman Catholics that are maybe even somewhat very Lutheran in this sense. I know a lot of those actually. I have a lot of friends that actually have a right understanding of the role of saints. And I always tell them all the time, you know, you really are Lutheran and you'll find in heaven that one day you were really Lutheran all along anyway. Uh, So you might as well just go, come on over now. But anyway, all joking aside, and then the same thing, you also laid out for us the reform and the role that they see. And again, we can't speak for every individual. And so these are kind of the broad categories as the theology is confessed by these church bodies and by these groups of Christians in our world today and historically. And so with that, laying out that foundation, uh, I think it's important that, you know, again, even as I kind of make my joke, you know, we'll find that we're all Lutheran in heaven, right? Because that's what we believe. We believe that we are rightly confessing the truths taught to us in scripture. And if you don't believe that about your church body, then it's incumbent upon you as scripture gives us to find that church body that does faithfully confess the scriptures. And that's, the responsibility of all of us as discerning Christians to find the place that feeds us with the pure truth of God's word. And so as I believe, and as Pastor Tim Sims believes, uh, that's found within the Lutheran church. And so it's important to get into some of these scripture passages that are cited here in our Augsburg Confession and the Apology, but also some other ones that we can bring in as well that talk about how we have this right understanding of the role of saints that we confess as Lutheran Christians. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Luther never sought out to be the Lutheran Church, we recall. You know, he, he simply wanted to get the church that he loved very much back to its scriptural roots. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, you know, and kind of leading into this, you talked about before the break, prayer is confession. That person to whom you are offering your prayers or bringing your prayers is really the one in whom you're putting your trust. And so that's what makes it problematic. If I believe in Jesus, but I'm invoking the name of a saint or going to that saint to go to Jesus or my heavenly father, that at the very least is very problematic because who am I really putting my trust in at that point? And Jesus makes it abundantly clear looking at the scriptures that they share uh, in this confession and some other ones makes it abundantly clear. Look to me. I'm the one to whom you should look. And the apostles continue that in their preaching and teaching and writing. So some scriptures that confess this idea that we are not to invoke the saints or pray to them, but instead we simply trust in Jesus Christ as our mediator and advocate with the Father and go to him in prayer. First John 2, beginning of verse 1, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Okay, see, I think that's a very important little thing there that John includes, because I think one of the reasons why people want to go to the saints, or sometimes, you touched on this a little bit, sometimes, even though we as pastors are called to pray for people, I think sometimes people come to us to have us pray with a misplaced piety that somehow their prayers aren't heard. But if I go to Pastor Sims or Pastor Smith, I know God will hear their prayer. And they could not be more wrong about that. They don't have to go to a saint. They don't have to go to us. Certainly, there is something about pastors praying for their people or for Christ's people that they've been called to serve. But it's not as if my prayer as Pastor Sims is more valuable or gets moved up to the head of the line versus the believer in Christ who prays themselves. And I think that's part of the piety here. I'm not righteous except for by Christ. Christ is the righteous one. So we pray in his name. Uh, when it comes to prayer without citing the whole thing, because we know it, I think one of the really telling questions and answers regarding whether we should pray to or invoke the saints or not is this simple question. Was Jesus ever asked how we're supposed to pray? And what was his answer? <laughs> he was asked how we are to pray. And especially in his context, he didn't say, invoke John the Baptist and ask him as the last great prophet to come to me, and then I will make sure that your heavenly father hears your prayer. That's not how he answers that question. When he's asked how to pray, he says, pray, our father, who art in heaven. And you know how the rest of it goes. And we can do that because we are sons and daughters of God in the Son, Jesus Christ. We can look to God as our Heavenly Father because of who Jesus, the Son of God, is for us. We don't need to go through anyone else. We can go straight to the Father in the name of Jesus. And just the way Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray is telling. Uh, we also, of course, have John 14. Verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But you can go directly to Jesus to get to the Father. You don't have to go through somebody else first. He continues in John's gospel, Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works, and these he will do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever we do, whatever we pray in the name of Jesus is the key. We're praying in Jesus. John 16, he makes this promise to the disciples, the church, and thereby us. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. That's his promise. Now, sometimes this text can be abused a little bit. It still has to fall within the will of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's exactly in the context in which Jesus is speaking. So this isn't, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? You know, this isn't, give me everything I want, Santa Claus, but this is looking to Jesus Christ and praying to him, knowing that with him we have an advocate with the Father, and he will give us that which we truly need and will care for us. So, you know, these are just... A few of these texts, especially out of the Gospels, they give us a very strong indication that we're not supposed to be praying to anyone else, but we can go directly to the Father. You know, one of the texts that we look at as far as defending, looking to the saints and their way of life and how they do things, also stands as a wonderfully positive passage regarding how we still actually go directly to God in prayer and don't pray to the saints, while at the same time looking to the saints as examples and ways that can be helpful to us as we live our life of faith. And that's Hebrews 13, verses 6 to 8. The Hebrews writer says, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's a quote of the Old Testament, of course. But then right after that, the Hebrews writer says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you in the word of God, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So just that tiny little section in Hebrews makes it clear, look to the Lord as your helper, not 
human saints. At the same time, look at how these human saints actually looked to the Lord as their helper and were sustained and persevered in the faith through very difficult times and trials. There's a few more we could get into, but I've, I want to see if you have any comments on this, brother. Yeah, as, as you were highlighting that one there, especially from Hebrews, I, I think Hebrews just, you know, just again and again throughout Hebrews just focuses us so beautifully on Christ, of course, and especially with regard to this issue, how we rightly regard the saints, because, you know, you see this in the faith of the Hebrews all the way back in the Old Testament. And you did have, you know, kind of the example that always pops into my mind is Moses, right? You know, that when the snakes are sent to chastise the people for their grumbling and everything, right? And they're looking away from God, right, as their provider, and they're grumbling against God and against his appointed leader, Moses. It says in there that Moses prayed for them, right? And the Lord granted relief. Well, he's doing what the Lord gave him to do as the leader of his people, right? But even there, we see accent in that story again and again. You know, don't put too much attention on Moses. He's just the servant of God, right? Uh, so don't look to Moses. You lift up your eyes to the hills again, and your help comes from the Lord. The Lord sends relief, yes, at the prayer of Moses, but it's a prayer centered on the belief that God is gracious and will grant his mercy. And obviously that prefigures Christ being lifted up on the cross, as we get said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And so all of these things give us that right understanding. And again, Hebrews, you know, just directs us very pointedly, you know, kind of slams this case shut, right? That, yes, they themselves looked to God for their help. And that's where you should look to be imitators of that of the saints, not of trusting that their work is somehow more worthy and so forth. Uh, you also mentioned John 14 and 16, and those come in heavy in the one-year lectionary anyway, and I know it comes in in bits for the three-year as well. But basically, from Good Shepherd Sunday in the one-year lectionary all the way to Pentecost, you're getting nothing but sections of John 14 through 16, John 14, 15, and 16. Basically, again, Jesus telling us, from his resurrection, right, to the birth of the church. This is exactly how we live in the church, is a prayer coming directly to the Father who himself loves you. And so all of those things are great things to accent. Excellent job in that. Go ahead and get us some more of these other scripture passages. And even as I bring in the one-year lectionary and how it approaches there too, I and I brought in earlier before the break, you know, just we know the term invocation, right? That's how we begin our divine services. I think there are things within our worship liturgies and so forth as the church that have us have a right understanding of this as well. So get us into some of those things. As well. Absolutely. And I, I think that is a good transition and kind of more the positive aspect because it, we spent several minutes now looking at the scriptures and the way the confessions use the scripture, kind of combating the way that the Roman church was thinking and acting in their piety at the time. But the other thing we need to be careful of is taking it too far and using this confession, this article on the confessions, to kind of correct the directions that we sometimes go in as Lutherans, going too far regarding how we should or should not consider the saints. So the Lutheran position, reviewing that just briefly, is not pray to the saints. On the other hand, it's also not, let's just not consider them at all. We are to look to them and find hope and comfort in how God provided for and delivered them in Jesus Christ and does the same thing for us to this very day. And there are some positive passages regarding the Lutheran position on that. Uh, some of those include, for example, Romans 8. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So in other words, we pray, and if we don't know what to pray for, we don't have to pray to a saint, but we can pray to God our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit knows exactly what we need. And it continues, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
And that addresses what we've been talking about already, but listen to how it continues. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. This would include saints that came before us who endured trials and persecutions and struggles and also includes us. So now I continue at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So I love that statement, conformed to the image of his son, because as we see in the saints, and as we being faithful will also experience in our own lives, we are going to be conformed to the image at some point in our lives of the suffering son of God, Jesus Christ, as Jesus has said. On the other hand, we can persevere as we see in the saints, knowing that we're also going to be conformed to the image of the resurrected, eternally living Jesus Christ as well. And so that's a wonderful source of comfort. And we see that the saints found great comfort that, including St. Paul, who wrote that, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we see that in other saints as well. And you brought up the liturgy and things that we do in the church. Uh, there's been a great resurgence, I believe. Uh, I, I grew up in a, oh, but my dad is a Lutheran pastor, wonderfully faithful man. What a great mentor he's been for me over the years. Grew up in a very wonderfully faithful uh, LCMS congregation. I don't remember any talk of the saints at all. And I think there's been a bit of a correction and a resurgence of how we should actually look at the saints in the last couple of decades. And I think we see that in our newer hymnal, the LSB does a great job of bringing that out, highlighting the church calendar and the feast days and the festival days. I cannot remember ever celebrating a saint's day for a divine service, for example, when I was younger. And now uh, we tend to do that, at least if it falls on a Saturday or a Sunday, we will do that at St. John. And not only those days where there's a saint's day on the calendar, can we look at how Christ provided for those saints and find great comfort in knowing that he does the same for us. But even in our weekly liturgies, whether it's a saint's day or not, there are some beautiful things in the liturgy that are exactly what the Lutheran reformers are confessing here. And that is this. We can remember, find strength with, and still stand with the saints of the Bible in our confession of Christ. So here's a great example, the Magnificat, one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry and or music ever written. We don't know whether Mary actually sang that or not, but we know it is very poetic and it certainly fits into music very well. And we include that. And we're reminded in the Magnificat that Lowly as Mary was, God chose her out of his grace and mercy. She found favor with God and was chosen to be the Theotokos, the God-bearer, okay? And that makes her unique among all other human beings in the history of the world. Only one woman ever actually gave birth to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that's Mary. And that would have been a very difficult thing for her and Joseph to go through if we really look at that story in detail. And yet the Lord sustained them and brought them about. And she, inspired by the Holy Spirit, speaks these wonderful words of comfort and peace that were not only comfort and peace for her, but as we look back on what God was doing through her, we find great comfort and peace as well. I think one of the best examples, though, when it comes to our weekly liturgy is the Song of Simeon from the Gospel of Luke, where we typically do the Song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis, now let us depart, the first words out of Simeon's mouth, where we sing, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. And we sing this after having received the very body and blood of Christ and forgiveness, life, and salvation in that sacramental gift and we are tied to this man all the way back at the time of the birth of Jesus, who was promised that 
the very Son of God and Messiah would be revealed to him before he died. And having Jesus revealed to him and the keeping of the promise of Messiah revealed to him, he could now live and die in peace. And when we sing that after having received the Lord's Supper, what we are also saying is, Jesus Christ is revealed to us by word and spirit and in this sacrament, and now we can live and die in peace. That is a great way to look at how we should look at the saints. I'm not looking to Simeon, nor is anyone else, when we sing that song, to do anything for us. We're simply saying, you know what? We stand with Simeon and all the company of heaven in praising God for giving us deliverance in Jesus Christ. That is the communion of saints, and that all kind of works together as we consider what the proper rule of saints is in our lives of the faith. I think that's well said. And again, the proper rule, the positive aspect of what we view, of how we understand the role of the saints in informing our faith directed at Christ is so key and so central and is beautifully accented so well in the saints' days observances of the church and the liturgical calendar and so forth. And it's almost unfair with the time we have left, and we still need to cover how this is kind of a hinge article into the abuses and so forth. It's unfair that I'm going to open up this can of worms, but I'm going to because I think it speaks to some of the contemporary issues as well. And it may seem a disconnected issue, but you talked about being raised, you know, your father, a Lutheran pastor, and I agree, Orthodox man, faithful confessor, raised in a faithful church as well. I had similar experience. My father's not a pastor, but was raised in a faithful Lutheran home, faithful Lutheran congregation. Don't remember much talk of the saints days at all. Now, that's not the question, their orthodoxy or anything. I think just for whatever reason, again, kind of things are a pendulum sometimes in the church. And I think in our upbringing and maybe for the last couple generations, there was this swing more towards what I would say is kind of the reform side. And, and I should be clear here too, we, we haven't accented yet that also falling in on this spectrum would also be the Orthodox and the Anglican and the Episcopalians and so forth, who do give regard to saints days as well. And so that's kind of another one of those things that fit in there and kind of a little differently than the Catholics or Lutherans, but we don't want to ignore them being involved in the spectrum here as well. They're not on the reform side. But anyway, as we kind of grew up in the era that kind of maybe swung more towards that reform side, which just kind of ignored the saints, what I have noticed is that there was a heavy observance of what I would call secular days within the church, right? the bringing in of Memorial Day and Fourth of July and all of these other things, Veterans Day. And I can even remember like having a veterans march into the church and so forth and singing God Bless America, which is actually not a Trinitarian focused hymn and so forth and and rightly not a hymn in our hymnal and so forth. And there's, again, there's a whole can of worms and, and not enough time to get into these things. But I think it's interesting that, you know, in a sense, kind of like the abuse of focusing on the saints, I think at times, especially as American Christians, we get too focused on government issues and our soldiers. And again, I am not speaking against our veterans or anyone who has served our country in that role. I'm, I'm a son of a veteran, thankful for my father's service, thankful for those who serve. And certainly, according to Scripture, First Timothy 2 and so forth, we can offer prayers and supplications. Again, it gets back to our theology of prayer, right? Where is our hope in? Is it in the soldiers fighting to defend our country and and all of those sorts of things? Is our hope even in this country? No, it's not. Because if it is, all hope is lost. But I think that we get so focused on that that we miss out on great opportunities. Like November 11th is St. Martin of Tours Day, who was a soldier and a faithful soldier and lived very piously and even had wonderful good works proceeding forth from faith. Uh, Martin Luther is named after St. Martin of Tours, right? And people would historically name their children after these saints, again, rightly focused on the example they give us. And that's something that was just completely lost in the church. And I think, again, just because of what it comes down to is it maybe begins in a right place, 
but then it quickly slides down a slippery slope that it becomes basically, and I think we see this still today, we have a secular worship of our country at times and of our soldiers and veterans and things like that. And I know that that's not the piety of many who do these sorts of things, but it's what it comes down to. And so that's that's the slippery slope nature of all of this, right? And so it's important to have that right focus. So as I open up that can of worms with only a couple minutes here and we got to get this summary statement as well, did you want to share any thoughts of yours on that, Pastor Sims? Well, I think there is a big struggle regarding culture and secularism kind of dictating to the church what we do versus the other way around. I'm sometimes frustrated with the focus that people want me to have on National Day of Prayer, for example, and then just a few days later, there's almost nobody in church for the Ascension service. (laughs) You know, that sort of thing. But, you know, it is interesting, too. You know, I think you brought up a very good point of how to actually incorporate the saints into the life of the church. So, for example, if you do have this observance or looking at, say, Veterans Day, you know what would be a great way for the church actually to do that is, as you mentioned, to talk about St. Martin of Tours. Because, man, what a great example for veterans and people who are currently serving to look to this faithful man who was a soldier. And that's kind of the proper role of the saints. Take that and apply it to things that people are going through or the things that we have in our everyday lives. And so uh, you did a really good job of that. (laughs) All right. Just a no good transition here, but just to move us forward, because we do want to at least read this summary statement already talked a little bit about how this this is a transition point, and we'll pick up more of this in next week's episode as we look at the transition to looking at the abuses. But there is a summary statement that's a part of this article and kind of helps us see the relation of this to the rest of the Augsburg Confession. And so I'm going to read this again from the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, a summary statement. This then is nearly a complete summary of our teaching, as can be seen. There is nothing that varies from the scriptures or from the church universal or from the church of Rome as known from its writers. Since this is the case, those who insist that our teachers are to be regarded as heretics are judging harshly. There is, however, disagreement on certain abuses that have crept into the church without rightful authority. Even here, if there are some differences, the bishops should bear with us patiently because of the confession we have just reviewed. Even the church's canon law is not so severe that it demands the same rights everywhere, nor, for that matter, have the rights of all churches ever been the same. Although, in large part, the ancient rites are diligently observed among us, it is a false and hate-filled charge that our churches have abolished all the ceremonies instituted in ancient times. But the abuses connected with the ordinary rites have been a common source of complaint. They have been corrected to some extent since they could not be approved with a good conscience. All right, thus far, the summary statement, which sets up this transition here. Pastor Sims, go ahead and give us a few highlights from this. We've talked about several of these things really at every article and all along in our conversation today, but just highlight a few things here in the last minute or so before uh, we head out here today. You know what? I hate to highlight a defensive statement, but hey, this is a defense and there's going to be more defenses coming from the reformers. I think this puts it best. It's a false and hate-filled charge that our churches have abolished all the ceremonies instituted in ancient times. But the abuses connected is what they're looking to correct. Here again, they're leading an attempt to reform the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And even after that becomes very clear that that's not going to happen, even as they become the Lutheran Church, they make abundantly clear We consider ourselves to be the Reformed Catholic Church. We have no intention or desire of starting or innovating a new church. We simply want the church to be faithful and to stay in those things which have proven to be faithful according to the Scriptures and to take those abuses, not limited to, but certainly including the worship of the saints, and change those so that we are using them properly in a way that puts our focus on Christ and the gospel, which is that he is our savior from sin, death, and the devil, he and he alone. All right, so next week we will pick up with the first of those articles of the abuses that ought to be corrected in the church. 
Of course, that doesn't mean that there weren't things addressed in the first 21 articles, but as the confessors have laid the foundation of showing how they maintain the faith of the church Catholic, while, yes, pointing out some abuses that have come in connected with those articles. Next week, we'll pick up with Article 22, which focuses much more on the particular abuses in the church that need to be corrected, beginning with the use of both kinds in the sacrament. For today, thank you to Pastor Tim Sims for joining us on Concord Matters and teaching us this Lutheran confession on the worship or invocation of saints from Article 21 of the Augsburg Confession. It's been a great pleasure having you join us again today, Pastor Sims. Thank you. Good to be with you. It's a privilege. And thank you also to our underwriter, Wicking Vicar. Be sure to check out their great line of performance clerical shirts. Perhaps it would even be a great Father's Day gift as you also remember your spiritual fathers in the faith, your pastor tomorrow. Blessed Father's Day. Maybe even remember St. Joseph as a great way to honor the fathers and the example of faithful fathers. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church.